My name is Jane Borowski, host of Invisible Tears. This podcast will be about my story and my words, talking about my own personal experiences and self-healing. I do not claim to be a therapist, counselor, or licensed psychologist. Hello, my name is Amanda Bedard, and I'm the co-host, producer, and editor of Invisible Tears. I'm a Reiki master, certified professional life coach, spiritual coach, wellness coach, and a counseling practitioner. Some of the content you will hear in this podcast may be disturbing to some. Viewer discretion is advised, but it is our hope by putting this information out there that we may help others to heal. We will always be a platform for truth and healing. This is Invisible Tears. I'm Jane Borowski, and I'm here with my co-host, Amanda, and her husband, Drew. And today, we want to talk about the Connecticut River Valley cases, or the murders that happened in the, from 1978 to 1988. Amongst those, there were eight women, and there was one survivor, which was me, myself and my my daughter that I was pregnant with. Let's talk a little bit about how it got his its name. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Connecticut River Valley murders started in '78. Most of them were in the, or the rest of them were in the '80s. Mm-hmm. The murders and the sites where their bodies were found were along the 91 corridor between New Hampshire and Vermont. Yep, which is called the Connecticut River Valley. Yeah, and most of the bodies that were found are definitely within the corridor of 91. Mm -hmm. Um, They're not too far off of an exit, whether they're in Claremont, um, here in Swansea. Saxons River. Yep. So, uh, and even there was one victim, Elizabeth Critchley, she disappeared um, very close to uh, off of 91. Um, she was hitchhiking. So we can briefly talk about each victim, when they went missing, and yep. and when their bodies were found. Yep. Uh, Amanda, if you want to start. Yeah, of course. So the first known is um, Kathy Milligan. Kathy Milligan was found stabbed to death in the Chandler Brook wetlands up in New London in October of 1978, and she was 26 years old. Yeah, and so Kathy wasn't actually connected to the Connecticut River Valley cases until after the fact, actually until quite a few years later. Um, And I believe that she was connected based off of her age, demographic, where she was found, and also the stab pattern. And then in July of 81, Elizabeth Critchley went missing. She was hitchhiking to Vermont. Uh, She was 37 years old. And her body was found in August of 88. She was believed to be stabbed to death. In August of 81. Or August of 81, I'm sorry. No worries. And she was stabbed to death. Yep, she was found in Unity, right? Yeah, and she was last seen in Framingham, Mass. Yes. And then there was um, Bernice Cordemash. She was 16. She disappeared in May of 84. Uh, She was last seen at a residence in uh, Claremont. And her body was found in April of 86. And because her body was decomposed um they did forensics found that she was stabbed to death Mm -hmm. yep and bernice was found um on cat hole hill road in newport now her age being 16 is the outlier um, among the other victims but by all accounts she looked and held herself like she was in her 20s um so that sort of falls into line with the rest of the women um, involved in this case is being looking or at least appearing in their 20s, early 30s. Mm-hmm. Or I would even probably say to some of the women that were in their were in their 30s probably looked a little bit younger. So um, based off of some of the pictures that I've seen too. So technically, all the women that were connected 
um, to the Connecticut River Valley serial killer. The ages range from 16 to 37, but it seems like there's a little bit more of an of a similarity of them appearing as if they're in their 20s, I would say. I also think that it had a lot to do with um, victim of opportunity. Exactly. Too. Yep. Um, they were all alone. Uh, most of them were hitchhiking. Yep. I was going to say destination hitchhiking alone in some sort of, you know, somewhat, I mean, not completely isolated area, but like you said, Jane, victim of opportunity presented itself. And then we got Ellen Freed. She was at a pay phone at approximately two o'clock in the morning. Uh, she just, she was a nurse and she had just gotten off her shift and she was talking to her sister on the on the payphone, and she went missing in July of eighty four, and her body was found September of eighty five, and the forensics had shown that she was stabbed to death. Yep, and she, and she was twenty six. Yeah, she was found along the Sugar River in Newport. Yes. Yep. And then next we have Eva Morris, who disappeared July of 1985. She was 27 years old. Um, She disappeared while hitchhiking. Um, Hitchhiking home from work? Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. Along Route 12. Um, Route 12 and the Walpole, she Charleston was area. Just out of Walpole, uh, walking into Charlestown. Mm-hmm. Yep, and she was found um, April of '86. Uh, actually, April 25th of 1986. Um, in Unity. Uh, in now Georgia. her body was found 500 feet from where Elizabeth Critchley was found. Right. Um, and and it's, it's interesting because they were actually found, what were they found, five years apart? Yeah, they were found five years apart. So Critchley was found August 9th in 81, and then Eva Morris was found April 25th of 86. So being found, you know, the dump sites essentially being, you know, 500 feet apart, that's um, telling. Yep, that's yeah. when the New Hampshire State Police really realized that there was something going on in the area, um, and that's when they started the task force um, to look at all these cases. Yep. Yep, yep. Um, it was actually um, within weeks. Um, there was, within a week or 10 days. Yeah, within 10 days, three they bodies found were found. <laughs> Eva's body, Bernice's body, and they, and then the next one that we were going to talk about was um, Linda Moore. Linda Moore was killed in her own home. She was stabbed to death in April of 86, and that's when her body was found that day. Mm-hmm. So in April, from April 15th to April 25th, there were three bodies found, and they immediately started a task force. Yeah. And it was between New Hampshire and Vermont. Mm-hmm. Both states worked together with this task force. Um, of what we have heard, Maine didn't want anything to do with it, which Maine was having a very serious problem up there with um, homicides also. Right. Yeah, and for those that are or, or aren't familiar with the Connecticut River Valley, so I mean the Connecticut River Valley really essentially runs along that 91 corridor, but it really spans both Vermont and, and New Hampshire. So Linda's home was actually in Saxton, Saxton's River, Vermont. So we have different the different sites spanning between New Hampshire and Vermont, but the common similarity is really like that 91 corridor that sort of breaks up the... Now, Linda Moore is the only one that was found um, being attacked in her home, not alone, but she was alone at her home. Um, I believe she was kind of sunbathing and doing laundry at the time, like hanging clothes out to dry, um, and was attacked, and her husband was the one who found her, um, was about two hours after they, they believed the attack happened, and he wasn't gone from the house all that long, so the window 
for that opportunity um, kind of raises a lot of questions as to was somebody scoping it out? Did they just happen to drive by and see her? Right. Right, right. And I mean, even though um, her attack happened in her house and she was found in her house, um, I, I can't help but discard that maybe, I mean, she put up a heck of a fight. They said that there was just blood everywhere. She fought like heck. Now, I can't disregard the fact that maybe he tried to take her. Right. And she resisted. Right. Because then you come to Barbara Agnew. Mm -hmm. um, Barbara Agnew went missing in January of 87. She was, she had just, she was just coming back from a ski ski trip yep um she was 36 single mom and um her car was found in a rest area off of 91 yep off of i-91 north the white river junction rest area and her vehicle was it was obvious there was quite the struggle and she was attacked initially in her vehicle right because there was blood and everything around mm -hmm. Um, but then she, she, um, she disappeared, and her body wasn't found until March of '87, and with obvious stab wounds, she was obviously stabbed to death. And her story is a little interesting because she was on her way home from a ski trip. It was snowing that night. Major snowstorm. Major snowstorm, yeah. and she had pulled off to the rest area. When she was only about 15 miles from her home? Even closer, I think Yeah, it I was. think she was closer than that. Like yeah, 11 yeah. miles, something like that. Something yeah. very so close. So that brings up to the question is, did somebody force her to stop at the rest area? Did she see somebody in distress um, being a nurse and wanting to just stop and help out, just being her, that being herself? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Why did she stop at that rest area during a major snowstorm? And uh, and that close and to being home. so close to home, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's it. I think that's definitely been one of the biggest, biggest questions, questions surrounding uh, Barbara was was why what why would she be stopped there? Yeah, uh, exactly, exactly. And in a future episode, we will be talking about a um, a gentleman that gave a deathbed confession um, to her murder. However, there's a lot of questions involved with that, and police at the time didn't put a lot of weight into his statement but it does bring to light you know the possibilities was this truly a one-off was this guy making up the story or if it was true then what else does that mean because right. by all accounts every other attack seems like it was a one person attack exactly. but this deathbed confession spoke of three assailants um that ab attacked and abducted her yep yep and she was found in uh, Heartland, Vermont, when she was found in March of 87. And then there comes me. And then there comes Jane. And then there comes me. Um, in August of 88, I had pulled over. Um, I had pulled into a closed store to get a soda out of a soda machine. It was about just before midnight. And I was attacked and stabbed. Mm -hmm. um, 27 times by this what most believe is the serial killer um, I survived my baby survived think, thankfully um, I was seven months pregnant and um, I, I guess um, the stab wound pattern and the stab wounds and the size of the stab wounds is how they kind of connected me into the Connecticut River Valley cases yep. um, and the fact that I was a victim of opportunity. Right. Um, it was late at night. It, the store was closed. There was nobody else around. The lighting in the parking lot was weird, too. Yeah. The Philpin lighting in that. the parking lot was really weird. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so it's uh, I guess that's how they connected me into the cases. Mm -hmm. And um, after my case, there's, he seemed to um, stop. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't know if he stopped. I was going to say, Jane, 
<laughs> what do you think? Do you think that he stopped? I I have read up so you know it's weird because I I mean I was only twenty two when I was attacked, and I didn't really focus on the bad in the world. I was twenty two. I was pregnant. I was you know living a twenty two year old life. I did my party and I you know carefree, didn't watch the news all the time, didn't, and don't forget, there was no internet back then either. Right. So, you know, to, um, to really, um, it was, it was weird for me to really start focusing and really uh, looking into serial killers. Right. A- and I'd done a, a ton of research on serial killers, um, mostly online, talking to some people that have um, an enormous amount of experience with serial with serial killers. Um, they've interviewed them. They've talked to them, and you know I've asked several questions about about different things with serial killers. And one thing I know, um, one common thing is they don't just stop. Right. Um, they for- don't. They don't just just stop and disappear. They just don't stop. They're forced to stop in some way. Exactly. Right. Yeah. They either are inca- incarcerated, right, or they move to another, um, dem- another another area, area, and, and possibly do the same thing. Although because of the different area, it's not connected. Yeah. And um, or, or they're dead. I was just gonna say, or they're dead. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of questions raised on why was I the last victim, and why have there been there haven't been any more i'm thankful that there hadn't been any more in the area um you know i i think that bothered me a lot that um with the information that i gave them these are still unsolved my case is still unsolved so my one of my biggest fears was um because he weren't he wasn't identified and caught and arrested he was gonna continue to kill right and uh but we haven't heard of any more cases that are connected that we know of yep (laughs) um i mean in more of our discussions we're gonna talk about more cases that we kind of think could be connected to the connecticut river valley cases Mm -hmm. um i know i have a couple in my mind yep um, for whatever reason, they haven't put them on the list of Connecticut right. River Valley victims. Um, we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. And now back to our episode. I think Drew has an opinion about why he stopped after you. I like your opinion about it. <laughs> <laughs> Being a man who was out there killing and stabbing women, um, how emasculating it had to have been to the fact that he couldn't finish the job with a 22 year old who was 20 or who was seven months pregnant who lived and survived and the baby survived you know Jessica survived how emasculating Mm -hmm. that had to have been um Right. I, I I think it's whether that's the case or not. I think it's a great. I think it's a great point. It's one of those going. Okay, if I can't finish the job here, what demographics do I have to change in order to actually fulfill that need to kill? Mm-hmm. And does that maybe tie into the elderly couples up in Maine? Um, mm-hmm. Because when talking with locals, especially in the a little bit north of here, you know, in the Claremont uh, area. Locals do believe that it's not just north and south killings, but there is some east and west killings going from Vermont over to Maine, hitting right. up more central and the seaboard of New Hampshire. Yeah. Throughout this process, I've definitely, I, I know that both of you guys have done it too. I've definitely hopped on to the different websites for the different cold cases and missing people. And all I can say is that if you guys haven't done that, you should. Um, just to sort of educate yourselves, not to scare yourselves, but just to sort of educate yourselves. There are quite a bit of unsolved uh, missing 
and cold cases uh, just in the New England area alone. Um, so throughout this process, I've I've scoured some of those some of those cases, and it gives me an uneasy feeling. But um, this this broad overview is definitely what's been connected to the Connecticut River Valley, you know, serial cases. You know, like like we said, we in further episodes, and as we start diving a little bit deeper, we very well may have an opinion about what should be maybe what cases should be discounted and or you know that they're a little bit too far of an outlier and what cases were were um sort of confused about haven't been included um into the timeline but jane what you said about how you were connected with the um with the actual you know stab and like the size of the stab patterns so one thing that we called out when we were looking at all these cases too was that in all of these cases, the throats of the women were cut and there were 20 plus stab wounds about the abdomen and the neck area. And quite often there was some sort of V pattern. I just wanted to make sure and call that out. That's a very specific, um, that's a very, that's a very specific stab pattern. Absolutely and, it is. Yeah. And, and on me with my attack, I was, uh, they, he also sliced my neck and right. cut my juggler. So, yep. um, and, and very well, that could be why Linda Moore is, is, uh, connected because right. you can't really, um, they don't have a whole lot of information about, um, you know, specific stabs or stab wounds or anything like that where her, just that she was stabbed to death. So, um, you know, maybe the authorities know more than, you know, more than what they've put out um, to connect her right. with the cases. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we don't we don't actually have like case files or no. or anything like that in Not front yet. of us. No. Not, Not yet. yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> hashtag, on that. hashtag goals. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we will try to get as much as we can. We, we would love to actually see that information. Yep, so the authorities used the stab wound, stab patterns, um, and along with where the bodies were found. Um, mm-hmm. Linda Moore is the only one that was found in her home. Uh, the rest were actually found in remote wooded areas. Uh, many were actually along the Sugar River, um, yeah. mm-hmm. which is an offshoot of the Connecticut River. Uh, yeah, we figured that out, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. that the proximity of where the bodies were found and the stab pattern is where authorities kind of started to connect all these different cases. Now, as far as the abductions areas, they're not in proximity. No. I would not say that they're in proximity. Correct. Um, now, once again, if you do look at like, okay, yeah, the Connecticut River Valley, how big of an area can that be? Well, it does run from northern Vermont, New Hampshire, all the way down to Connecticut, mm-hmm. um, right through Massachusetts. It goes through Springfield, which once again, there's a lot of stuff happening that happened in Springfield, Mass., um, that I don't think have been tied. Yeah. Now, right. does happen, to, there does tend to be more along the it's male victims in the Springfield area, but it's still a lot of bodies being found in and around the Connecticut River. Yeah. Connecticut River. And, and I mean, even if you go, if you go on this, the, the cold case sites or the missing persons, there's a lot of um, missing persons along the Connecticut River Valley, too, where their bodies haven't been found. Right. Or their remains haven't been found. So, I mean, I, I'm, I, it would not surprise me if there were more victims mm-hmm. that just have never been found. Yep. Yeah. As, as, as I've tuned in and with my, with my gut, I don't I understand why this is the uh, complete picture that we have and why all of these cases have been connected, but I don't think that it's a full, it's a, it's a full mm-hmm. scope by any means. I think that there are more. And as far as bodies not being found, where we live, we know that the power plant and the dam can chew up some bodies. So if oh, anybody's absolutely. dropped, you know, north of Bradaburl, the bodies have to carry downriver through the power plant and the dam there. Um, which every now and then a body will actually make its way through and it's found down in Massachusetts. But there are times when nobody resurfaces. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. While morbid, but that's his, a good point. <laughs> one of his MO, his. That's why the sturgeon are so big down there. They're just feeding on bodies. Oh, God. That's horrifying. <laughs> that's why I don't swim in the Connecticut <laughs> River. <laughs> um, but we, uh, we should add, though, that it's we've never seen him throw the bodies into the river. The bodies have not been Correct. found. Yep. In the river or off the river or anywhere in that vicinity. Right. It's always mostly been in a wooded area. Yep. In a wooded area that's in a wooded area most often that's somewhat near a river, but you are correct. It never yeah. use the river as like a forensic countermeasure or anything. Yeah, like, like that. the sugar river is almost like a stream. True. It's very, very small. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's, very small. It's in long. Places. Oh yeah. Very long, but it's not very wide at all. Yep. And um, we found we found that Sugar River by a lot of the sites where the bodies were found. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is, uh, I'm surprised that's never been um, really anywhere on 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 the internet or anything. Yeah, when we were just really looking at the cases and actually looking at the. Um looking at some of the sites where the bodies were found and essentially just looking at maps and, and all of a sudden realizing um, Sugar River was Sugar there. River, <laughs> Critchley, Cordemarsh, Freed, and Morse were all found um, right along Sugar River. And although the bodies were found in a wooded area, it's not like there was any extra effort to dispose of the bodies, especially with the rivers being right there. They weren't buried. They were just kind of laid out. So was there revisiting that was happening or what was the cause or the reasoning behind that? And that's where uh, Jane's case gets brought up as to, well, hers is more in line with the Linda Moore attack because he didn't try to abduct her. But I actually think he probably did try to abduct her. Yeah. But I think that car driving by during the middle of the attack spooked the hell out of him and it was more of a... I got to get the hell out of here. The job is done. Yeah. Um, I think I think that it was he I did think that try it, to take me. Right, because that was his and first first initial, you know, confrontation with with you was to really like confuse and and to take you. Um to confuse and take you. I think a lot of it was her fight. She, you fought like hell. Oh, I did. You broke your freaking windshield <laughs> with your foot. You know, like, I mean, you thought there was, and you've said before um, that you just knew, like, he wanted to take you, and yeah. you knew that there was no way that you were going with him because you would not survive that. So. And that's like, that's why Barbara Agnew is so similar to mine because she fought like hell not to go with him. Yeah. Um, there was so much evidence there that she she fought for her life not to go with him and right. and ultimately he ended up um, taking her. Um, and that's why I say I kind of you kind of wonder about Linda Moore. You know, yeah. Did he try to take her and she just fought for her life and and fought really hard and right. We don't, yeah. we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. That's, that's interesting, Drew, that, that you brought up the um, the revisiting. I think that's nothing yeah. that actually ever popped into my mind. But, I mean, you are right with the way that the bodies were found. They weren't tried, you know, they weren't, they weren't buried. Um, he didn't try to use the water as a forensic countermeasure, even though they were, most of them were right by water. Yeah. Was there revisiting? We know from going to um from going to some of the places where these women were found that there's no way that someone would just come upon these areas it's it's quite clear that he would have to have some sort of knowledge or prior history of knowing the lay of the land whether it's a hunt whether whether he's a hunter or something like that um, they're extremely remote areas. Yeah, very. Um, I, I think all of them are on dirt roads. Right. And dirt roads today. Oh, right. And dirt roads yeah. today. Right. We, we have to remember yeah. that this was happening back in the 80s, too. Yeah. Yeah. So they're still dirt roads. So, 
even in the 80s, it's extremely remote. Right. Um, we noticed a few new houses that were built along that road where, where Eva and um, uh, Elizabeth were found. Yep. Um, so it, it, it was extremely remote. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think anybody's ever brought up the revisiting, but I actually think that that's a really, that's a really good point. Who knows? And we always thought, too, is that he was very familiar with the area. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel it's obvious to me that he knew where he was going to bring them to kill them. Yep. Um, That was pre-planned. That was absolutely pre-planned for him. Yep. He knew where he was going. Yeah. Yep, I agree. I agree. So we wanted to just give an overview to the listeners that don't know what the Connecticut River Valley serial cases are, um, because we will be talking about each and every one of them throughout the um, throughout this podcast, um, and we are going to dedicate an episode to each victim, talking more in depth about where and when they were taking, like even more in depth than what we just did with this quick overview. Um, try to talk to some of the family members to find out. You know, what was that woman like at that time? What was her mind frame? Um, What would have caused her to actually get into the vehicle of somebody? Mm -hmm. Now, once again, back in the 70s and 80s, hitchhiking was a completely different, you had a different different outlook on hitchhiking than you do now. It was commonplace back then. I mean, even all through the 80s, it was pretty commonplace. I can't remember the last time I saw a a hitchhiker. Mm Mm-hmm. Nowadays. I know. I know. Yeah. Nowadays. Yeah. Oh, Uber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's important to to speak to what Drew was just talking about with a you know more dedicated episodes to each and every one of these women, and trying to speak with family members or people that were impacted you know by what happened to them because we want to make sure that everybody understands and gets to know these women in life, and their legacy, and what they were like. They are not just a statistic. They are not just a bullet point. Um, We think that it's really important for people to remember them, you know, um, and understand what they were like in life because just because their lives ended, unfortunately and tragically like this, that that is not what distinguishes them. Exactly. I I don't want them to be forgotten. Ever. And... uh, I mean, a lot of these cases are 30, almost 40 years old, and they're unsolved. These cases are unsolved. Nobody has ever been arrested or charged for these murders. Um, So I I really, this was one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this podcast. And um, I was lucky enough to find two wonderful uh, co-host to do this podcast with me i don't want these women to be forgotten yeah uh they deserve more than that absolutely and uh yeah i i just don't want them to be forgotten yeah and we don't either in the future episodes we will be talking about the suspects that are involved in this case or how they came about to be suspects um and whether we put some weight into those suspects or discount them completely Um, It'll be interesting because I do believe that we'll be rewriting the history of this case with who people think is the attacker. Right now, when you look up the Connecticut River Valley serial killer, you see one name. We're going to make sure that that name is never brought up again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfectly worded. Perfectly worded. Thank you, Joe. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Invisible Tears. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast to hear all future episodes. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We also have a website, invisible-tears.com, where you can keep current with any events that may be happening with our podcast, read more about Jane and the team, and read more about all the Connecticut River Valley unsolved cases. If you are looking for everyday items, clothes, collectibles, or a gift for that special someone, you can support us further by checking out our retail store, The Frugal Marketplace. We can be found at thefrugalmarketplace.com 
or search for us on eBay and Poshmark. We hold an online claim sale on Facebook Live every Monday night at 7 p.m. where you can find our latest items for sales or items at a deep discount. If you're local to the area, please stop in and say hi. You can find us at 919 West Swansea Road in Swansea, New Hampshire. The links for our products can be found in our show notes. If you want to learn more about my wellness practice, Guided Path Wellness, head to guidedpathwellness.org. There you can read more about me and my certifications, more about the Reiki and coaching services I offer both in person and remote, and read all about my products for sale that I make through the practice. Feel free to utilize the contact us section on the website with any questions or utilize that free 15 minute consultation booking button if you have any questions about what might work for you. Evil may exist in this world, but we will not let it win. See you next episode.